is up and welcome back to 24 Minutes of A24, the podcast that takes a look at the A24 library 24 minutes at a time. I am Ethan Simi. And I'm Ben Lahore. And this week on the pod, we are saying goodbye to Española as we talk about the last half of The Curse. A newlywed couple struggle to make their vision for eco living a reality in a small New Mexico town. Ben, we're fucking here, man. It we're only took it. months and months and months of wearing you down. <laughs> And we finally made it. You made it happen. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're finally going to wrap up the curse. Uh, I'm excited to talk about it and then to never talk about it again. What the <laughs> hell? What is going on? Oh, this is crazy. This is crazy. Okay, well, the curse, we did talk about it back on episode 116 of this pod, and I believe mm. we're on 155 now. So we're okay. we're like... Almost 40 episodes removed from talking about episode one of The Curse. Um, we then proceeded to talk about episodes two through five on episode 120 of this pod. I want to I want to cycle back to that and and talk about what we thought about those five episodes mm-hmm. um, and then maybe see how they compare to now. We do have like one piece of housekeeping, kind of. Um, yeah. This was interesting. A24 just tweeted out the other day like, Josh Safdie, Timothy Chalamet. Marty Supreme coming soon. Um, what? Yeah. So it was a very minimalist tweet and then just like a picture of a ping pong ball. It's just like, okay, I guess this is coming out. You know, it's like, it was almost cryptic, you know, it was, yeah. it was very clear what, what it was, which was like, what are we supposed to do with this information? It was, it was a real interesting drop. It was super interesting. I think it caught a lot of people by surprise for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, including us. I guess Timothy Chalamet is going to star as a pro ping pong player, Marty Reisman, in a biopic written by Josh Safdie. Now, I think it's a, I think it's fascinating to say the least, if not slightly strange, that mm. Josh Safdie is going to be releasing this film. Presumably, we can only we can we can only have a hunch so far because all it said was coming soon. Yeah. But I would assume that means by the end of the year. Presumably around the same time that Benny Safdie is going to be re- releasing The Smashing Machine with Dwayne Johnson in December, I believe. Yeah. So this is this is weird because A24 is quite famously like the Safdie, home of the Safdie bros, really. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, good time, they made Uncut Gems, like we're going to foster what the Safdie bros want to do. Obviously, they've been parting ways as of late and working on very different things. And it's a great week to bring this up, of course, with Benny Safdie being in the curse. Yeah. Um, and A24 just like couldn't let either of them go. They're like, we still want both of you, even if you're separate, which I think is funny. It's so, yeah. And them releasing this like possibly so close to each other is interesting. Having like this Safdie showdown of sorts. Um, I'm curious. It sounds like Smashing Machine is maybe going to get the slot. Oh, I just happened to be wearing the shirt today. Oh, let's go. Iron Claw, Iron Claw respect. Like they're getting the the spot that I think Iron Claw should have gotten, you know, mm-hmm. so you get some like Academy recognition. But um, yeah, super interesting to have these both come out around the same time, like you said, with both of them going their their separate ways. Do we know, is this like amicable or is it, like, do we know the story behind it all? Like, are they just like taking a break from each other? Are they going to come back together? It's a great question. I don't know. I personally like, haven't done a whole lot of investigating or reading. I kind of just yeah. accepted like, oh, cool. They're just like, they have different visions. And I really do think that's what it was. I think they just have different visions of what mm-hmm. they want to create. Uh, honestly, I'm, I'm really interested in the logistics concerning Timothy Chalamet with this because he has been filming the Bob Dylan biopic. Oh, yeah. So I'm curious like when he filmed this and like if it's still ongoing or like, I just, I wonder about the logistics of, what coming soon really means. Like, did they rap and a 20 was four was finally like, cool. We got it in the can. Like now we can put out some info. I don't really know. Yeah. Or like coming soon. Like we're going to start filming soon. Like who yeah. knows what that means. It's, it's we're so going to kick it off, kick it off yeah. soon. We're going to oh, let you man. know when we start filming. Yeah. I mean, and presumably Timmy's going to be locked down next year doing Dune Messiah. Uh, even True. though it's not titled Dune Messiah. I mean, we all know that's the case. So I don't know. Hot commodity. Um, I'm out on Timmy. Wonka stinks. I mean, that's just where you're wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm just like, this This whole lineup just has me so amazed with actors. Cause like to go from Dylan and then to play, um, you Paul know, Atreides. whatever's Paul Atreides, 
and then in the middle just to play this like ping pong player it's like yeah. man acting is crazy man it's nuts <laughs> it's <laughs> acting <so> is crazy <laughs> <laughs> i agree yeah crazy stuff uh really interesting piece of news from a24 so I'm, I'm curious what that means and uh the back six months back really back five months for a24 is looking pretty good yeah. right now i'm really interested in all that so like I said, last time we talked about The Curse, episode one was on episode 116 of this pod. We talked about two through five on episode 120. So if you're interested on our thoughts on a more deeper scale for the first half of the season of The Curse, go check out those episodes of the pod. I gave it an A-24. You gave it a B-24. I just want to like dig into that for a brief second because the way you're framing what you thought of the back half does mm-hmm. not match a B-24. That's true. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Oh, I, wow. I will not be giving the back half of B24. What? Wow. I'm not this saying is gonna, it's going to be this worse. This is going to be an uh, interesting pot. This yeah, is going to be really fascinating. it's not going to be a B24. Wow. I think okay. I gave it a B. I, I mean, I have to go back and listen to it, but like with some optimism, you know, it's like, you oh, know, the first okay. half has been okay. Hopefully it'll be, you know, pick up, whatever. Um. So, yeah, I don't know. We'll get into it. Okay. Uh, can I quickly ask you, since we're talking about a TV show and yeah. you did, you did mention like, I can't wait to talk about it so I can never talk about it again. Um, we talked about Sunny last week here on the show, yes. the new, the new a 24 show, uh, on Apple TV plus. Have you thought about Sunny one time since we hit stop on our recording? No, I've thought about it multiple <laughs> times. Um, <laughs> oh, really? I, yeah. Yeah. The, the more distance we get from it, the more I'm like excited about what's coming. So oh. yeah, I'm looking forward to covering that. Maybe that'll be my version of the curse for you. Where I'm going to be like, <laughs> you have to finish it. We have to talk about it. And I'll just be like, I will never watch the rest like, of Sunny. No. Like I don't <laughs> give a shit at all. Uh, I asked that obviously because we hit stop on our recording and, um, until a TikTok came up last night on my feed where someone was like, it was a sponsored TikTok and someone was like, A24's new show, Sunny, is so good. Ooh, I yeah. literally didn't think of it until that moment. And then I was like, oh, no, it's not. And then I just kept going. Um, So I don't know. Tough. I guess we're just on opposite planes today, which yeah. is always fun to do. I feel like I feel like that that happens sometimes and I and I do dig it. Um, mm. We're going to go through each episode. I have a synopsis for each episode my goal is to spend the primary chunk of this episode talking about the final episode of the curse episode. For 10. Sure. I think that's where the most interesting conversation can happen. So if you're ready, we can start going through these six through nine. Really? Um, you're much more fresh on them than I am. Cause I yeah. have not rewatched these particular episodes since January. Yeah. Um, yeah, I am more fresh on it. Uh, I still don't know how much I'll remember, but uh, <laughs> oh, you know, no. share I'm gonna put yeah, I'm, boys forever. Let's do it. I'm gonna put your your thoughts to the test here. I'm gonna yeah. see if you really stick to your guns. Um, okay, episode number six: the fire burns on. We're just gonna dive into it here. Um, Whitney finds a cut of flip bl- flip lanthropy. Man, flip that's lanthropy. tough. That's it a is. tough one. That's a tough one. Um, episode uninteresting. So she and Dougie scheme to play up Asher's awkwardness and insert conflict between him and Whitney. That's interesting. I just want to, I, I know I said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to break there for a second because, (laughs) (laughs) because I love the curse and I think it's fucking phenomenal. And so like going through this, I'm, it's going to spark a lot more things that I like, wasn't ready to, that I didn't think I needed to talk about. Um, I think Dougie and Whitney's relationship is so strange and like semi parasitic where it's like they, they both just like kind of want to be famous and they'll just like do whatever it takes to do that. And it's kind of, it's kind of gross, especially in terms of this where she's like, well, I guess we'll just play up the drama between my husband and I, not a big deal. Yeah. Anything for the show, anything for success. Um, I will say from the first half to the second half, Dougie's the character I've switched on the most oh. and uh, in a good way. Like I, I mm. started to like Dougie. I was like, okay, yeah, this is an yep. interesting, really interesting character for sure. And so I did rewatch episode 10 um, like a week ago when we mm. originally planned to record this and then life happened and we pushed it. Um, but I did rewatch the final episode and Dougie, I just, when we talk about the final episode, Dougie is the character where, I kind of like feel the most for. And I think it's really Mm -hmm. interesting how his character arc goes in that direction. Um, Okay. Continuing. 
He approves her idea of changing the title to Green Queen. While filming at a firehouse, Asher finds Rock Chicken in the bathroom sink and believes Dougie is pranking him. Though surveillance footage reveals that he was not responsible. While trying to sabotage Dougie's budding relationship with Kara, Whitney sees in their text that she is interested in a statue that offensively depicts an indigenous caricature. Asher innocently asks Nala to guess how many screws he is hiding in his hand, and she guesses them correctly, though she becomes upset when he squeezes his hand so hard he cuts it with the nails. The raw chicken in the fire department is fucking hilarious, and Asher's hyper-obsession going scrubbing the cameras is the craziest thing ever. What happened? Like, how did it get there? I, I mean, I still think Dougie's behind it somehow because, like, his assistant mm. goes in there. Um, and I think it's just a way to, you know, cause some drama or whatever. But the way Fielder plays that obsession um, is, I mean, he he does fantastic acting in this show for sure. Like, all three of our leads are doing a great job. Yep. And he really plays off that manic obsession um, superbly. I think now is a really good time to bring up the point that the curse not nominated for any Emmys this year. Yeah. Whatsoever. That's um, kind of crazy. I mean, yeah. I, I have a big problem with that considering how much I'm attached to the show, but like I genuinely think it's crazy, especially under the guise of like, I can understand maybe not Nathan Fielder. I get that like a little too edgy for, for that body voting yeah. body. Emma stone, like, Emma Stone just won an Oscar. Like, how are you not going to nominate her for an Emmy? Yeah, even one of those things of, like, let's nominate her to get her to the show kind of thing. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, De- I thought for sure. It's a DiCaprio like situation, for sure. Yeah, like, she's not going to win, but let's let's get her here. So, yeah, I was I was surprised. Did it get just completely, like, nothing at all? Like, you nothing no at all. nominations? That's wild. I'm pretty yeah. sure the Bear got nominated for 25 uh, awards in the comedy category. So, that's... That's where we're wild. at as a society, <laughs> which is also insane. Um, I did see some screenshots going around and people were like, yes, my favorite comedy, The Bear, and it's just people <laughs> sobbing, uh, which I think is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, okay, the only other thing I want to talk about in this episode, Asher squeezing the nails. Mm. Did Nala just like randomly guessed, right? Like she was just lucky that she got it right and Asher continues to believe that she has this kind of power this this hold over him right? yeah i mean that's how i felt it's like honestly how many screws could you fit in your hand anyway you know it's like there's a, yeah. a limited range here he's not gonna have like a hundred so it's like <laughs> do you think not- you would guess it right like if you gave if you if nathan fielder gave you a shot and you were like yeah i'm gonna get i think right. plus or minus one yeah i think i'd be oh. in the target range i mean how many would you put in your hand you know what i mean like if you were doing it mm. like could you fit 10 screws in your hand like that's crazy I feel like you're guessing yeah. between like one and six. So it's just like, I don't know, three. Like how many do you have? So <laughs> just I, split I don't the know. difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Safe bet. I feel like that is totally accurate. And Nathan Fielder's commitment to play Asher the way that he does is mm-hmm. is unrivaled. And I I genuinely think it is shocking that he was not nominated for an Emmy for this. Like this scene alone, he he's losing his mind in real time. And yeah. he's physically harming himself because of it um was there anything else about this episode you wanted to mention i mean we're talking about it now but i just i love the hold that nala seems to have over him like he yeah. is just like convinced of this curse you know just like this girl just like doesn't give a shit about this guy at all <laughs> but he's just like the way again that he's just like fixated on her it's like is it real is it not whatever i i love that dynamic So this is another interesting theme that I think the show tackles really well. This idea that Asher thinks there's a curse, but it all stems back to him, like basically being a shitty person and like Mm -hmm. doing a bad thing. Right. And like, and like not actually letting them keep the money and like, and, and doing something wrong to them. So I think it's this really interesting commentary on like how we align ourselves with our bad deeds and like how we try to, either justify or not or live with them or not. And like, this is just how Asher plays that idea out. Um, And he just like chalks it up to this curse. So he can basically absolve himself of like, no, that was a choice that I made. He just like says it's a curse. Um, Yeah. I think that, I think there's a lot of interesting things here. Okay. Episode seven, self-exclusion. Nala tries to curse her school bully to fall off the climbing rope during gym class and is ignored by her teacher when she complains about her negative treatment. 
This is interesting that it's the opening sequence of this episode because it's a direct juxtaposition to what we get to finish the prior episode yeah. with her possessing powers or the curse ability and then her not. I, I think like Asher and Nala's relationship, like you said, is so interesting. They feed off of one another because I don't think either of them know what the truth is. Yeah, and I think this is an attempt by her to like see like oh can i curse people because this other guy seems really yeah. convinced that i can <laughs> like but uh, in my mind she's just a kid and so she's like i curse you and that that's all that was you know <laughs> um but now she's just like wait do i have this power and just like her trying to figure that out i thought that was interesting i would love to start walking around and, like if just people make me mad at work <laughs> just being like i curse you I and curse just like you. scaring people <laughs> that's the that's what you have to do that's the thing mm. Whitney buys the statue and gives it to Kara, missing the point of her art being that she steals and repurposes racist products. Kara agrees to keep working on Green Queen when Whitney offers to hire her as a consultant for indigenous depiction, and Whitney confesses her uncertainty with her marriage while filming with Dougie. Um, hiring Kara as a consultant for indigenous depiction, like, uh, honestly, from what I remember, good for Kara, just like stealing a bag from Whitney, being yeah. a pretty terrible human being that's a easy 20 g's she made right there like that was like yeah i'll be a consultant whatever that means you know like i'll do that so yeah great for kara that was awesome and it's this constant revolution between every single character of like what is morally acceptable for who you are and who you identify as because in kara's situation maybe it is a little amoral to take advantage of someone like that instead of teaching them like hey mm -hmm. What you're doing is not good. It's harmful for the community. You're not helping. Like you are, you're literally gentrifying all of the things that that matter to this community. But instead, Kara's taking it on for her own personal gain. So I think everybody in the curse has some tinge of like amorality yeah. that they have to convince themselves to live with. I think Kara's a really interesting in uh, for that idea. Um, Asher is kicked out of his class when the instructor pressures him to make a joke about his penis, which offends several students. Amazing content, just elite content all the way through. I mean, I think this is where like Fielder shines so much. Like I, I love him. I love him in like the rehearsal and Nathan for you, uh, but seeing him truly acting and doing it in the scene like this was just like, yeah, it was elite. It was perfect. I loved it. Yeah. I think it's so funny that like, it's, it's unfortunate for Nathan Fielder, but it's so fortunate for us that like he fits the mold of, Oh yeah, that guy's got a micro penis yeah. so well. Like it yeah. just, it just works. Um, I love it. Perez airs her her story about Whistling River, where Asher is seen in the footage laughing over the board, taking a woman's winnings, which he and Whitney argue about. Nala's bully trips and injures herself on the playground. Um, I think the casino sub story, like sub narrative, is really interesting because again, that's like. That's Asher's kind of gr moral gray area uh, where he once believed something and now he kind of reacts differently to it. Yeah. Um, but I think he, Asher and then is it is his name Perez, the guy I that he's so, like yeah. friends with from the casino? Yeah. Their relationship is so weird, man. It's so weird. It's so, yeah, it is really strange i mean i we get that at like the beginning of the first half of the show where mm. when asher's there trying to get the footage or whatever um we kind of see there that strange dynamic they have like how much are you guys friends versus just like co-workers or that's the know, gatorade like, bit right yeah yeah exactly unbelievable <laughs> yeah it's so yeah it's an interesting dynamic between them for sure i, I don't I don't know that I love the casino storyline mm. as it went on so like this part just like it didn't i don't know that it paid off for me but Fair. um yeah. yeah yeah it does definitely feel secondary again like i'm i'm a little bit removed so i i don't feel qualified to talk about the casino storyline which i think proves its its presence maybe a little unwarranted yeah um okay episode 8 down and dirty was there anything else you want to say about episode 7 no i'm no, i'm good okay. let's go to 8 uh, Fernando confronts the Seagulls on their increased petty crime Whitney's no police policy has brought to Española, leaving Whitney disgusted when Asher weakly tries to stand up for her. Again, like, she has, Whitney has a huge, like, non-confrontational problem where, like, mm -hmm. she just thinks it's better to let things happen. And I don't know if it's in this episode in particular, but there is an episode where, like, all of these kids come in and they just, yeah. like, take the clothes and like 
they're like, okay, well, this is just like what happens and what they get to do. And in turn is detrimentally harming the community. Yeah. It's kind of wild. I think this is this episode where it's like the cold okay. open or whatever. It's like those kids like, yeah, like someone else came and you just like take the jeans and you can just leave. And then they all go in there and just like take a handful of shit. It's so interesting. Yeah. That her, her actions are kind of having the opposite effect of what I think she's wanting him to have. So yeah. Yeah. Kind of interesting. So weird. Um, okay. He bumps into uh, Bill in public. Asher bumps into Bill in public, who ignores him. Was this in the? This is in the um, hardware store. It's like a hardware right? store. Yeah. Oh man, I remember watching this scene, and it's that's the thing with the curse. I feel like the farther you get into it, the harder it is to watch. And so, like, you get to this scene, and you're just like cringing so terribly because it's so apparent that Bill is ignoring him, and Asher has this weird. Not like vendetta, but like obsession with getting his attention. Yeah. And it just gets harder and harder to watch. Yeah, it really does. I mean, just following him around the store and finally, I think, confronting him, quote unquote, confronting him at the front. I think while he's checking out, he's like, oh, yeah. I didn't hear you. Hey, what's up, man? You know, it's just like <laughs> now that other people are around, it's like, I guess I have to acknowledge that this person is here. After Dougie presses Asher about his cuckold fetish on camera, they go out to dinner and drive to Nala's, where Dougie pleads with her to curse him when they are alone. Real weird Dougie shit here, man. Yeah. Just like basically going into Nala's room and being like, curse me. Curse yeah. me. Please, please curse me. But again, a really interesting insight into Dougie's character because like we don't learn a lot about his history and with his wife. And I guess he drove drunk and killed his wife. Is that correct? Am I remembering that right? Yes, exactly. And aside from like the dinner that he has with that one woman, we don't really hear much about it. And so like, this is his way to absolve himself and say like, mm -hmm. Oh, I was cursed. Like I, I didn't make that decision. That was not my mistake. I was cursed. And like, yeah. I, now I am cursed. Like bad things happen to me. Um, really bottom of the barrel like grasping for hope for Dougie which I said like and you said you really started to grow to like Dougie he's probably got the most amount of like tangible like oh I see that you want to be a better person but mm -hmm. you just don't know how to do it yes yeah I think that's very true I mean this sequence was so uh awkward i guess and just like was was giving me some level of anxiety because this is when they're like switching all the batteries and the smoke detectors and he's yeah. like oh yeah i have some here in my pocket but, and he just like, like hands yeah, him fakes. a napkin or something <laughs> like that you know i was like oh my god how do you pretend to swap out batteries while like yeah keeping the father's attention and stuff like yeah there's so much going on during the sequence as he starts to cry a scared nala calls for her her, fa her father abshir and asher drags dougie out they argue as Dougie drives Asher home, and after Asher brings up Dougie's dead wife, Dougie curses him. Which again, like, I think <laughs> they, this is so fucking funny to read to me. Um, yeah. Whitney and Kara attend an art gallery, and Whitney decides to film in the house, staging a conversation where she praises Kara's art. When asked, Kara explains that her turkey piece was her cutting off bits of her Pueblo identity and giving it away, and later throws out the statue when she arrives home. Whitney filming inside this home. She goes into some weird room with some guy. Um, mm -hmm. She's definitely like cheated on Asher before, right? Like we're we're aligned on that, or what do we think? It definitely seems like she has. Yeah, yeah. she's okay. very comfortable in what she's doing. Yes, um, and a really weird exploration for her as a character, like to try to get out of the life that she's in while retaining the potential fame that comes with the show. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Cause they, they are kind of rebranding to the green queen, I think. So she could be solo, but there is a, a aspect of her being with Asher that kind of needs to be carried over. So she can't completely like separate mm -hmm. herself from him. Is this the episode where, um, where Asher raps with Dougie in the car? I on the think way home, so. Is this what yeah, it is? that sounds familiar. Yeah, I believe it is. Hilarious shit from Nathan Fielder. So like, good. Just like the the most Fielder core you could ever get, where he doesn't say the N word, he just breathes instead. Yeah. And I'm curious how long it took him to nail that scene because if I was if I was Benny Safdie, I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. I bow out. 
No, he's just like the <laughs> whitest white dude just rapping this <laughs> stuff. Like, but it, it was done so well. Uh, so good. That's a good episode. I like that episode. Any anything else? No, I mean no. Okay. Okay. Penultimate episode, episode nine, Young Hearts. An HGTV representative requests that the Seagulls marriage be shown positively, so Whitney takes Asher bowling. He runs into Bill, who explains he ignored him after believing he leaked to the press, though now believes it was someone else. Wanting to impress Whitney, Asher proudly declares himself the leaker. So, such a strange dynamic in their relationship. (laughs) A Green Queen crew member is fired when he leaves a distasteful note on Whitney's car after his friend's relative is evicted from her parents' building. I want to pause just for a brief second to talk about Whitney's parents, because this is kind of the next sentence in this as well. Um, And her relationship with her parents, super interesting themes of like generational inequality and like belief in what they're doing is not wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. It just like stems from parents to to kids. Yeah. There, there is that uh, interesting dynamic where she's trying to separate herself from them, but is also seemingly pretty reliant on her parents as well. So it's just like, she kind of can't agree with or stand for what it is her parents are doing, but also needs them. You know, she, she yeah. needs like needs them financially. She needs them on, on a lot of different levels. So yeah, that dynamic is really interesting. Yeah, it is. Um, She's really reliant on, on them. And like, I think sometimes she refuses to believe that, but she's really reliant on a lot of people in her life. And I don't know if she necessarily realizes that. Um, she confronts her parents who point out the man was a bad tenant and she takes their money without any issue. Again, like it's the same thing that happened with Kara to Whitney, right? Yeah. Like she's got no guilt about taking their money, which I think is a really fascinating, pretty dirty concept about this show. Um, she and Asher watch a cut of the green queen episode where she comments on him holding her back from her dreams shaken. He admits that he never gave Nala the money and that he is the real curse tearfully promising to improve as she looks at him stunned in silence. This scene to end the penultimate episode going into the finale, we are like, okay, anything can happen. Like we don't know what's going down next. Um, and his acting, I, again, I, I know I'm a, I'm a, record here like a broken record but like no emmy like what the hell it's it's astounding like i mean honestly all three of these people i think deserve some recognition for what they did uh in this show and i I don't know i think they all acted their asses off to be honest um some great relationship dynamics here some you know the back and forth and yeah fielder just really really brought the heat i think i mean he's up against like an oscar winner but he's like holding his own like and i just want to briefly mention like nathan fielder is he's not like a bad looking guy but he looks the way he looks right yeah emma stone is drop dead gorgeous so like to act against that as well and to have like that physical um kind of dichotomy in their relationship is really interesting to me um This is giving like big challengers vibes to me. Um, and when, um, when art kind of like lays in Tashi's lap and it's just like, it's over, like just hold me kind of a thing. Um, I'm getting big vibes of, of them like kind of sharing the same theme here. Uh, yeah. Good episode. Good episode for sure. I like it. Yeah. Okay. Episode 10, green queen. This is exciting. Okay. We made it. We made it. Um, Okay, here's the deal. I'm going to read through the whole thing and then we'll backtrack and pick up because I I, I want us and the listeners to know exactly what happens in the whole episode so we can cohesively give our thoughts. So this is my verbal affirmation to you that I will not stop in the middle of reading this. I've heard it before. I've heard it before. <laughs> Let's see if I get past the, seat of the first sentence. Okay. <clears throat> Whitney is later heavily pregnant and has stopped taking. How? What's the time <laughs> jump here? What do you think? Because we're not given a time jump, are we? No, I, I think we are. No, I don't remember seeing a time. Are we? Do we? I don't remember. Three that, months but... later, I think. Huh. I don't know. I gotta check my notes. I feel like I. The curse. Okay. Mm, yeah, I don't see anywhere. I don't. I didn't write down a time jump. 
Like, would it be after the Rachel Ray stuff? Like, I don't remember when it says what the time jump is after on that they're on that cooking show. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I can't remember. Okay. Well, I failed. Uh, Whitney is later heavily pregnant and has stopped taking money from her parents, while her and Asher's marriage has improved. Green Queen has been renewed for a second season despite its middling reception. Okay, I'm going to keep going. You got to remind me of this. We got to go back to this sentence. As a gift uh, gift to Whitney, Asher gives an uninterested Abshire ownership of the property. The next morning, Asher wakes up to find himself stuck on the ceiling, as if gravity has reversed for him. Before... This is so hard to get through. Before they can figure out how to get him down, Whitney goes into labor. Her doula helps Asher out of the house, but loses his grip and gets him stuck on a tree branch. After the doula drives Whitney to the hospital, Dougie arrives and believes Asher is trying to avoid being a father. As Dougie films Asher panicking, the fire department attempts to get him down by cutting the branch off with a chainsaw, ignoring his pleas to stop. Asher is sent flying upwards and dies floating through space in the fetal position. Meanwhile, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Meanwhile, Whitney undergoes a uh, C-section and holds her son while Dougie remorsefully weeps over Asher. As he explains the situation to the police, onlookers recognize Asher from TV and assume the incident was a stunt. Okay. I have so, so many things to say. I've been waiting for this moment for a very long time. Yeah. Let I would like to know what you thought of the episode as a whole. Because, obviously, a complete showstopper of an episode like there's no way anybody anybody on the planet would have been like oh this what's gonna happen in the final episode yeah no i mean there's no way to know what was going to happen it's the definitely the most interesting episode of the season and i think for better or worse i i'm sure a lot of people were this way but i just got caught up in like the technicality of it all like how did they do this logistics yeah yeah because like this looks so impressive and then kind of reading about it and learning that they made like an upside down set and like the right side up and just kind of like split all that kind of stuff. It's amazing what they were able to pull off. It looks pretty flawless. It does. Um, It looks sensational and there's a lot of good pieces out there uh, to read like about it. I know one of the other things that I remember reading was like, they had to think about this final episode when they first started filming the show because they didn't want to change the layout of Asher and Whitney's home. Yeah. So as to keep it like a continuous experience for the viewer. So they had to like build that into the entire season, which I think is astounding. Um, so- Green Queen renewed for a second season despite its middling reception. Here's what I wrote down on, on my notes. Um, this is what Whitney says. Everyone I know says they can't find the show anywhere and now nobody is writing about it. This show is unbelievably brilliant when it comes to the fact that it knows it's a show on streaming yeah starring nathan fielder and emma stone it's a very dark weird comedy that is just kind of fucking awkward and it makes like it makes a point to say like nobody's writing about it nobody's talking about it like it's just a show that gets lost in streaming we cycle back to that at the very end when the onlookers look on and say like oh it's probably just for a tv show I think that meta text from this show is superb to be like, it's just TV. Who gives a shit? And yeah. I, I just, I find myself gravitating towards that so much when I think about the curse. Yeah. It was a fantastic line. I mean, especially the fact that this lives on Paramount plus, you know, which is like, <laughs> God gotta damn be... I literally didn't know where to find it to watch the final episode. I had to Google, I had to go to letterbox. I was like, where do I watch the curse? I couldn't remember. I I pulled up HBO Max because I thought that's what it was I did on. too. I thought yeah. it was a Max. Yeah, I was like, all right, I typed in the curse and it wasn't there. I was like, wait, hold on. I was like, oh, fuck, it's Paramount, which is like, I mean, the fifth biggest streamer. Like, I don't even know where it would fall in there. Yeah. But it's just like, it's crazy. Like, again, who has seen this? Who's been able to see it um, as, you know, well done and as good as it is? Like, no one is talking about it. And yeah. like you said, that meta text, I think is just so important. It's so good. The Rachel Ray intro um, with the guy from The Sopranos Mm -hmm. and Rachel Ray just completely not even caring about Asher and Whitney yeah, is super funny and exceptionally difficult to get through. Even on like this was my third time watching the final episode because I I remember watching it and then I rewatched it the next day because I was like, Mm -hmm. I got to make sure I saw what I saw. Yeah, Um, Yeah. And then I and then I watched it for this third time it's still like the worst to go through and like everything about that scene is, is so cringe. And then you get to the end 
where you know they're they're obviously going into Rachel Ray kind of on a Zoom call, and so like they're in a home or whatever, and the whole crew on their side is demiking them and like getting them all yeah. done with the show and stuff, and the person asks Asher like permission to take your mic off. Permission granted. And he's like, God damn it. Like Nathan Fielder, you are so <laughs> Nathan Fielder. Like, why do you have to do this? It's incredible. Yes. It's so, I mean, I love that whole Rachel Ray sequence because they have to just sit there quietly, but smiling the whole time. Like yep. you can't look like you're bored. You can't, you have to stay present as much as you're being ignored. I mean, there are times, you know, for my job, I will, I will film people doing like talking heads and things like that. And there's so many times I have to tell them like, just keep looking at the camera and smiling until I tell you cut, you know, cause I mean <laughs> yeah. like they finish their sentence and they just want to like move on and look around. It's like, you can't do that. I need you to keep looking at the camera. And this is just like an extended version of that where it's just like, no one's talking to you for minutes at a time, but you just like, you gotta be here cause everyone can see you. Um, and yeah, the awkward levels are just like, they're so intense. And Rachel way and Rachel Ray's ability to basically like Whitney's like, we repurposed our basement and like, that's, that's what we did. And Rachel Ray's like, I can't give up my gym. And it's yeah. like, Oh, okay. That's that. Like, that's what you think of their home on your show. Uh, unbelievable stuff. Um, yeah. okay. Giving up sheer the house, the gift of the house. Obviously we see Whitney and Asher breaking bread together. Um, and, and, you know, um, celebrating the Jewish, Jewish culture. Uh, and, Whitney makes an exceptionally off-color joke, which I think is placed remarkably in this show um, about the Holocaust mm. and goes to show her like behind closed doors and what, who she is, I guess, essentially. Yeah. All this to say, they go to Absher's house. He doesn't react the way they want. He's much more concerned about the property taxes. Who's going to take care of this? <laughs> yeah. Hysterical stuff because it's all to cleanse the conscience of Whitney and Asher Who's the guy? Who's the friend in Abshir's house that passes in front of the camera? Do you remember this guy? No, I do not remember. Okay, so there's a guy. They go, and we get a camera shot looking from the home out towards the door. There's a guy with a huge mustache that passes in yeah. front of the camera. Asher says, who is that guy? And Abshir says, just a friend. We don't, we see him one more time but like in the same frame kind of a thing. Yeah. There was a lot of discourse when this episode came out and I know you weren't part of it. Cause like you didn't see it at the time of like, who's that guy? What does it mean? Is it all like, is any of this not real? Like, is that some kind of guy in, you know, making some kind of simulation? Like, are they taking advantage of Whitney and Asher? Like there's all of these massive theories. I don't think anybody on the show has come out and said like who it is. And I'm still fascinated by it. So I'm curious if there's listeners out there that have seen the show that also are interested. Yeah. Like let us know. Cause I'm very curious by who that person is. Yeah. I'm really, really curious. Um, dream catcher present for Whitney and Asher's kid made in China. Love Unbelievably it. hilarious. Yeah. So good. Not following their own standards for their home by having that kind of tech box built in for their child's home. We spend like 10 minutes doing that with the contractors depressurizing the room, all of these things that build into what make the final, you know, 30 minutes of this episode um, practically believable of like, mm -hmm. okay, maybe the house didn't depressure. Maybe we got to press the button. Maybe that's why we're floating all of this stuff. Um, and then we get to the floating. Um, what did you, what did you take this to mean for Asher? I, I mean, is, was this the curse? Was this his curse? I have mm. no idea. Um, there was talks earlier in the season where he just talked about like not being around if she didn't want him kind of thing. And like, was this the manifestation of that since she didn't feel like she needed him anymore? Um, yeah. I don't know. There's like, there's a lot of ways to read it, but I think that's what makes the episode so enjoyable. It's just like, there's, it doesn't feel like there's a clear cut answer. It feels like it can be interpreted so many ways. What did you yeah. read it as? Yeah, that's definitely the the brilliance of the episode. I think that's what makes it so interesting to me and like easy to come back to is like every time I watch it, I'm like, well, maybe it means this, maybe that, maybe the other yeah. thing. Um, I definitely fall along the lines of like um, similar to you where Asher's reality is kind of constructed in what Whitney wants. Mm -hmm. And so with the baby coming, 
Asher is finding himself less and less at the center of Whitney's life. And because of that, this physical manifestation happens, whatever it is, magic, gravity, weird magnet pocket, like whatever he thinks it is happens. Um, And at the end of the episode, he floats into space. Her baby is born. Mm -hmm. I think like, I think that it, I think that's the curse. Like, I think to your point, he is the curse and the curse is that there can only be one embodiment of what he is. Yeah. And so like the baby comes into the world. Asher cannot be in the world. Like that, that curse can only inhabit one soul at a time. That makes sense. So that's how it like gets passed down. But again, like there's a billion questions to that, right? Like if you want to know the logistics of it, you're not going to know because like, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, and I, I think about it from Whitney's perspective as well of like, it seems like she's pretty happy at the end of the episode. It seems like she's pretty content, even though Asher is not there for the birth of their child. Mm -hmm. She obviously doesn't know that he's floated into space and died, but she knows that he's not safe. Um, And for her to still feel comforted, it's, it says something at least. Yeah. It's like, she's over, well, they're just like consumed with the child coming in, obviously, as you would be, yeah. but to the point where like nothing else seems to matter to her while the rest of us have been literally just cutting back and forth throughout <laughs> this episode of like the trauma and stuff that he's experiencing right yeah. now. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting dynamic between them. Yeah. Um, so I have a I have a bunch of questions written down. I'm reading through them to make sure we progress here to answer the questions that I want. Um, when the doula pulls Asher outside, yeah, I still lose my breath when I watch that. I'm still like, God, oh my God, like what are you doing? Kind of a yes, thing. Like why yes. would you guys do this? Um, their doula is hilarious, by the way. Uh, Moses, mm-hmm. I believe his name is. Yeah. Just calls Whitney mama all the time. Like, you got this mama. You got this. So <laughs> so good. M- Molly actually watched this episode with me. She knows nothing about the curse, has no insight into, like, the thematic elements or anything like that. She she just wanted to watch it for the practicality effect. Yeah. Um, And we both were just, like, dying laughing every time that doula was on screen. Yeah, it was fantastic, but it brings on this, like, level of anxiety of just, like, why are you going outside? Like, just yeah. stay inside, <laughs> stay where it's safe. This is, this is not good for you at all. But um, yeah, great character. Um, So then Dougie shows up. Dougie, of course, brings in this extra element of like believing that Asher is running away from responsibility and parenthood. Mm-hmm. I definitely think that's a, that's a play here. I definitely think you can read into that um, from Dougie's perspective specifically, because Dougie does say, Must be something about responsibility or fatherhood. But I wonder, too, if that's kind of the nature of the curse is like it kind of manifests what other people project on it. Right. So like Mm -hmm. Whitney was no longer primarily concerned with Asher. So like a physical embodiment of his disappearance. Dougie thought he was running away from fatherhood and responsibility. So a physical manifestation of his disappearance, right? Like, so it's, it's all of these things I kind of folded in. Um, Really interesting perspective from Dougie to like show up and just be like, guess Asher's not ready for fatherhood. (laughs) Yeah. Absolute dog shit friend. Just like, yeah, he's hiding in a tree. I guess he's not ready to be (laughs) a dad. You know, it's like, but yeah, I mean, how good of a friend has he been the whole show anyway, you know, but um, Yeah. yeah, it was, I don't know. It's so, so interesting This, like, this was one of the best, like, forms of acting from Fielder, I think, is this episode. Like, the real panic and terror in his voice and on his face. Like, I I, I felt like it was real. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. yeah, like, you guys need to listen and no one gives a shit. Nobody believed. Like, that's what I think is so interesting. And I, I do really think it, like, goes back to that meta commentary of, like, it's just a show. It's just for streaming. It's just for TV. Like, nobody believes Asher. So like you can also take that to me and like TV shows. We talk about Sonny, the curse, the sympathizer beef. We talk about all these TV shows on here and like, they're just TV shows. Like they're not movies. Yeah. You know? So like there is automatically an embedded sort of like low level respect for these projects, these pieces of art, these narratives that like people just don't put on the same pedestal as a movie. And so like, Mm -hmm. For nobody to believe Fielder 
I think is really interesting in that meta text. And like, it's, that's, that could be like really stretching and really reaching. But I do think that's part of what all three of them, Safty Fielder and Stone, are getting at and why they attach themselves to a fucking TV show. Yeah. And I, I, this is the moment where he's arguably the most sincere throughout the entire show. And their whole show is set up of like, yeah, we're here because we care about everyone, all that kind of stuff. And that's like, well, that's kind of a facade for what's happening on the TV show. But then yeah. we get, it's almost like boy who cried wolf, you know, then we get the moments mm-hmm. like where he actually means it. And everyone's like, okay, yeah, whatever, man. Like this is for something else and no one gives a shit. We get the direct kind of relations of the branch getting chainsawed and then Whitney getting a C-section. So again, like this physical manifestation, two of the same thing happening in different forms to different people. Mm -hmm. Um, Fire department, good fire department, bad fire department. I mean, if you think (laughs) about it though, like if someone showed up, like I'm going to float away, they're like, (laughs) okay, what? You know, like that's just not a thing. Uh, So I don't necessarily blame them, but uh, yeah, it's just like, sounds like someone who's, probably on drugs or whatever. And that's why they did what they did. Like, let's just cut them down and we'll figure it out from there. It, but it, it like, so interesting, interestingly continues this thesis of a moral gray area because the, the fire engineer that like chainsaws down the branch and effectively kills Asher yeah, is now has to live with that decision. Right. Of like, did I do the right thing? Was it the right thing to cut down the branch or should I have believed this person? Yeah. And they're stuck in this moral gray area. And like, so it expands to even like characters that we don't know or don't care about at all. Um, his, his acting in the, in the tree branch is insane. They won't put the net over him. Um, why, like, why don't you just put the net over him? You know what I mean? Like no, no harm to your, you guys as a fire department. Just yeah. do what he says. I mean, I'm with you, but it's just like, (laughs) it's so wild to think about it in the real world. You just be like, this man is drugged out. (laughs) Like, what does he talk? You need the net (laughs) below you, you know? Like, (laughs) yeah. yeah. I like how they do kind of like lay it on top of him, whatever. It's like, this is not going to help him at all. But like, he knew he's like, you gotta, you gotta hook this in and you gotta like cement it into the ladder. And the guy was like, don't worry, man. We've done a lot of these before. Like we'll put the bag underneath you. (laughs) Um, yeah, that's hilarious. Um, and then, so Dougie has a drone this entire time, which I think is mm. an interesting aspect to Dougie's character of like always this this content capturing and creation. And that's ultimately how the show began is like his addiction to capturing moments. Um, yeah. Dougie has a huge breakdown. And this is kind of what I put a pin in at the beginning of this pod that I wanted to come back to. Um, huge breakdown knowing that the reality is that Asher did in fact float away and he is yeah. dead. He no longer has a friend, even a perceived friend. Um, He knows nobody on this planet because Whitney is now consumed with her birth and knows. Mm -hmm. I feel like Dougie knows he'll be kind of ostracized after this. Um, And the Green Queen, I don't think is what he wanted it to be. Um, Yeah. And I just think there's a lot of complex things at play there for Dougie that really inspire him to have a complete emotional breakdown. It is hard to watch. It is such a breakdown as he just sits there on the ground. Um, but yeah, he's lost everything uh, that he thought he was getting or thought that he had. Mm-hmm. And it's just, yeah, it's such an interesting scene. Um, I remember reading about it. You may have as well, but, you know, Safety talked to uh, Fielder, just like, let me know when you're ready. And he sat there yeah, for like yeah, 25 yeah. minutes just to get in the zone, you know, and then then let it happen. It's like, man, he really fucking dialed this in. Like it was fantastic. Not worth an Emmy though. Guess not. Jesus <laughs> Guess Christ. Not. What are we doing? What are we doing? Uh, okay. Last thing that I particularly want to call out about this episode. I wrote it down. I know I've talked about this. We don't have to like labor it again, but I specifically wrote down the quote. So Asher floats away. Um, all of this hubbub fire department, all of these things, right? You get neighbors nearby that are watching it happen And they interact. There's these two guys that interact. One of them says, what movie are they filming? How do they do that? Huh? And then the guy goes, so it's for TV? And the other guy says, I think so. And to end your show with that idea, I think is like one of the greatest things that you could do. Saying like, nothing fucking matters when it's on TV. Um, And I just like, I this is like the eighth time I've mentioned it. I just like can't stop obsessing over that idea. Um, 
and now and now Fielder got that out of his system. Now he's going to go direct a movie. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's it's a real interesting call to like how maybe numb we've become as a society. It's just like mm. you can you see everything, and so it's just like if you saw someone floating away into space, it'd be like ah, it's probably for something. You know what I mean? Right, like it's, right. That's not real, but if it's a sincere thing that's happening, it's just like, you would be amazed by that. But now we're just kind of at the point where it's just like, all right, like, I don't, you know, whatever, you know, like that's yeah. just, it's probably some for something, some influencer or something, you know what I mean? It's like, well, whatever. <laughs> yeah. The desensitiz- desensitization of humanity uh, yeah. is really, really interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, true cinema moment for me, it's, it's, I, I'm just going to pick the whole episode 10. I just think it's a fucking masterpiece. I really do. It's hard not to when you're, when you're going six through 10. I mean, it's yeah. just no one there. Like you said, there's no one that could have expected what we got before watching it. There's just no, no way. And they pulled it off. Yeah. There's just no way. Um, okay. A one act. So we've already done Nathan Fielder. We did Emma Stone. We did Benny Safdie back when we did the curse on a couple of other episodes. So I wanted to do season finale episodes. Okay. There's there's been talk of like, yeah, there's some ideas for a season two. We didn't plan a season two, but it's out there. Um, I don't think we're gonna get a season two. I don't think it deems it necessary, and yeah. I don't think like the story really warrants it. Um, but on the off chance that there is, I didn't want to do like series finales. There's of course a ton of historical series finales out there. I kind of wanted to go with season finales instead. Cool. Um, here's what I've got on the short list. Uh, the Simpsons, Who Shot Mr. Burns, part one. That would be season six, episode 25. So all of these will be the season enders. Um, mm-hmm. MASH, Goodbye, Farewell, and Amen, uh, season 11 finale. Grey's Anatomy, Death and All His Friends, season six finale. How I Met Your Mother, The Final Page, season eight finale. The Sopranos, Fun House, season two finale. Lost, Through the Looking Glass, uh, season three finale. Succession, this is not for tears. Season two finale, another succession, All the Bells Say. Uh, that would be the season three finale. Better Call Saul, uh, the season six finale, Saul Gone. Breaking Bad, the season four finale, Face Off. And Game of Thrones, the season six finale, The Winds of Winter. Have you seen very many of these? I have seen five of them. So a little under half. The Simpsons, Mm. both successions, Breaking Bad, and Game of Thrones. Oh, interesting. Okay, I've seen How I Met Your Mother, both successions, Better Call Saul, and Breaking Bad. So I've also seen five, just a different five. Nice, yeah. Um, I think it's interesting we both share succession. I'm not sure if that'll go into your pick at all, but... um, I it's it's tough. I think the ones the ones that I have seen are really really good. Um Breaking Bad Face Off is kind of like unmatched in my opinion. Um in terms of like a season finale cuz like that was leading into season 5 which ended up being like a part 1 kind of going into yeah. season 6 like they ended up splitting the season into 8 and 8. Um and that was really when we learned that Hank knew who Walter was. Mm-hmm. And like the whole show built for that. So yeah. I think that would be my pick. Uh, follow up would be all the bells say succession to season three. Just astounding. Yeah. I'm going off list here and I'm going to kind of cheat. It's that's from the same show, but it's two different season endings. Oh, I'm going to go with the office. Oh, nice. And there's the end of season two, Casino Night, which in and of itself is a fantastic episode. So funny. It's hilarious. It's so good. <laughs> you, you get Creed winning a fridge. He's like, this is great. I've never owned a refrigerator. So it's like, what the fuck does that? Like, who would ever say that? That's crazy. But we get the ending where. Code Jim, name Remax is here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We get Jim like con- kind of confessing his yeah. love to Pam and then going into the office while she's on the phone with her mom and kissing her. Like, I don't know. I've waited so long to do that. And then like it ends and it's like, so we've been good. waiting two seasons for this payoff. It's like, Oh shit. They kissed, you know, whatever. That's crazy. Yeah. Cut to season three where Jim left and he left Scranton, you know, and now he's at Stanford or whatever. And he's now with Karen. And then the end of season three, I think for me, gets me every time, every time, every, every single time. time. 
because like they're doing the interview thing in New York and you can just see him sitting there thinking about like, does he want to be in New York? Does he want to be in Pennsylvania still? Whatever. Then we cut to Pam giving her interview of like, no, it's great. I think it's awesome that he's doing this. This is great. And then like, I'm, I, this sounds so cheesy, but I feel like I'm getting chills now talking about it. But like <laughs> he comes in, he knocks on the door. He's like, Hey, are you free today? Free dinner, yeah. uh, she's like, yes. He's like, all right, it's a date. And then he leaves and that's it. And then like the smile, like the look on her face, you know, just like, fuck, we're finally getting it. Like we've been waiting the whole season. Like we wasted the time with Karen. We're getting Jim and Pam. Here we go. I love both those season finales. I think they're both fantastic for different reasons. I do maintain that he should have stayed with Karen. Uh, I think that's the better fit for him, but I love both of those. That's a crazy take. That's a crazy take. She's a better fit for him. Pam's a wet blanket. What? (laughs) Why would Karen be a better fit? She's more fun. Karen? Yeah. Karen's too commandeering. No, she's too overseeing of Jim's dreams. Come on. Yeah, could be. (laughs) Maybe he needs that. That's wow. Those are some good picks. Some good picks. Uh, okay. A 24 ranking the moment I've been waiting for. Um, yeah. do you want me to go first? I think it's pretty clear and apparent. Let's hear it. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with an A plus 24. I think the curse is just masterful on every level. I think every episode is simultaneously the worst thing to watch and the best thing to watch. And like, yeah. you have to watch it through your covered eyes most of the time. Um, mm-hmm. I just like, I don't know what else to say. Like RIP, we didn't get any Emmys. I think it's bullshit. Um, A plus 24. I do think it's bullshit. They didn't get any Emmy nominations. Um, even though I feel this is a C plus 24 show. Oh, um, man. It's A plus acting from all three of our leads. Like they all should have been recognized, but this show overall just kind of like fell flat other than this like amazing final episode. It's like, oh, that, that's great. But like, we never, we never met the, the funny tone of like cherry tomato boys again. We never like yeah, okay. address like their personal relationship that like we get that one sex scene between them, which is very <clears throat> revealing, but then like nothing ever really develops with that again. Like the, I think that's when I left the, the first half of the season. Like I hope I'm optimistic that if they keep going with this, I'm really going to enjoy it. But it just turned out that like, I didn't really love like they're, there's no bad episodes. I, I C plus is still like a positive. Um, I would still like tell people to watch this, but like, I don't have a desire to revisit it. So that's what I would go with. Okay. Uh, man, I, it must be hard to be wrong so often. Um, but I wish you the best on your journey. Moving Thank forward you. With, I appreciate um, the support. With A24 Brothers. Thanks for keeping uh, me on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see you back next week. Uh, I think you've maintained your <laughs> second chair status. Um, okay. Any final thoughts on The Curse? Episode 6 through 10 or not before before we get out of here? I mean, just to reiterate what we've been saying, it's a shame they didn't get recognition. They deserve it. It's a, yeah. it's a well-crafted show at the very least. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's amazing that like they just didn't get any anything. I think it's crazy. Uh, I've curated my Twitter to basically be every other tweet is people complaining that the curse didn't get any noms. Um, and I yeah. built that br- brick by brick and I feel really good about that. Um, next week in the pod, we're trying to check out Janet planet. Um, I, question mark. I don't know. I don't want to promise anything to the listeners. So I, I would just say like tune in next week to see what we talk about. Um, Cause it doesn't look like Janet planets on VOD yet. And it's in no theaters. Yeah, it's like it's on VOD for pre-order, but it doesn't have a release date yet. Like you can pay 20 bucks to pre-order it right now, but it doesn't tell you when you okay. actually get to watch it. So Janet yeah. Planet could be one of the best movies of the year and I still wouldn't digitally pre-order it. I think that's psychotic. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I am interested. I know it's like a it's not a perfect system, but just looking at the Rotten Tomatoes, have you looked at it for Janet Planet? No. Do you want to know I what haven't. it is? Are you curious or do you want me? I, I, don't I do. I do. I want to know what it is. Yeah. I the, can't wait. The, the critics give it 85%. Okay. Uh, the viewers give it 40. Oh, interesting. That's oh, that'll be interesting. Shift. Yeah. Okay. So I'm curious about that, but yeah, I don't know if we're able to watch it in the next seven days, then we will talk <laughs> about it. If not, then maybe another movie someone has recommended to us that we can yeah. actually watch. Yeah, we got to find a backup. I'm telling you, we got to do a Spring Breakers rewatch one of these days, man. We I got gotta... my uh, online ceramic shirt. I'm God. happy to throw it on for the episode. I'm so, I'm so mad. There's this guy at my local theater, and he's there every show that I'm at. He has a Spring Break Forever t-shirt or uh, hat. 
And nice. I'm like, every time I see it, I'm like, man, I, I wish I had some merch. I really turned around on that movie. I used to, I, I, I'm pretty sure on the pod, I was like, this movie sucks. And now I think it's great. Yeah, I don't know that you were super into it. I think you were bummed that that was like the ending of our show every week because we break forever. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad maybe you that's the thing. On maybe it. I've said it for 155 episodes, on, yeah. and um, and it finally broke me. Where I'm like, like spring it. break forever. Like that's got that's the coolest movie ever. <laughs> if that's uh, what it takes, and uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll just say Cherry Tomato Boys for uh, the next 150 <laughs> yeah. episodes, and I'll be into it. Switch it up. There we go. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, let us know what your guys' thoughts are on episode six through 10 of The Curse. Did you enjoy the second half more than the first? Did you enjoy the whole season? Uh, we're on Twitter and Instagram at 24 minutes of A24. Also, if you have like a movie recommendation or something you want us to watch, like we are very it's receptive up. to that. Like slide into the DMs and tell us, like we would love to have your recommendations. Um, yeah, and don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. You can watch us talk about these projects. Uh, we appreciate all of your support. I am Ben Lawhorn. And I'm Ethan Simi. Spring break forever, bitches. Bye.